Let's keep talking about the dollar now. The, since 1971, the U.S. dollar is a paper currency. It has no real banking, uh, backing, and its value is determined strictly by its scarcity. In 1928, a silver dollar looked like this, or the dollar actually looked like this. It had a silver certificate across the top of it. It said, uh, this certifies that there has been deposited in the Treasury, the United States government, one silver dollar payable to who? To the bearer, to the owner, upon demand. So if you got tired of your government and said, I don't trust this government, you could take that down and convert it into silver. We now have a different kind of currency. And it says across the top, no longer silver certificate, but it says Federal Reserve Note. No more about anything payable to you on demand. Instead, it's just a note, a legal tender for all debts, both public and private. Why do these paper monies and currencies lose value over time? There's really four stages of money. They don't begin that way. Every, every single economy begins typically, especially we go back in history, it begins with a commodity currency. So villagers get together and they begin to look for something to use as currency and they begin to use maybe corn or wheat or gold or silver or metal or whatever they can, sh shells, they've even used shells in the past, cattle. Anything can be used as money as long as it's divisible and it's a unit of account and it's a store value. And over time it becomes kind of difficult to lug all this stuff around that you've accumulated so then you begin to find a warehouse to put it in and get a receipt. And then you can use these receipts and go pay people with them as the economy progresses. Eventually the government gets involved and says, let us back up those receipts, let's not do all this, and they'll move it to what we call a fiat money or a, or a currency that's backed up by the full faith and credit of the government. We currently have a global fiat system. The Swiss franc is the only one. And I'm not, when I mention the Swiss franc, I'm not saying you should go get, go get it necessarily. I'm just saying that it's the only currency that I know of that actually has a small correlation to gold still. And then stage four, after fiat money, and let me say this word with an, emph with an emphatic state, always leads to hyperinflation. Fiat money supplies, like we see all over the globe, always lead to hyperinflation. Now, before I talk about some of the cases of hyperinflation, let's define inflation and hyperinflation. Inflation is an increase in the money supply. Let me give you an example. We're all on an island, okay? Maybe uh, me and you are on an island, okay? And I have two golf balls in my pocket because we were playing golf and we got stranded on this island somehow. You got two golf balls on, in your pocket and, we, and, and now we end up on this island. And you find a banana tree, okay? And I love bananas, all right? So I say, how much do you want for that banana. And I don't have any money. So we decide, let's use these golf balls as money. You say, I'll, I'll take one golf ball for this banana. I say, no problem. So I'm getting ready to reach in my pocket and give him a golf ball. And all of a sudden, out of the sky, we hear this helicopter. And we look up and we see this big box just come falling down to the, to the ground, thud right into the sand right in front of us. And it says on it, golf balls, one million count. Now what happens to your price? Are you going to go up or are you going to go down? You could go up, couldn't you? If he had asked me for five golf balls before that landed, would he have been a nutcase? Absolutely. There's no, there's no such thing. But after a million landed on the island, guess what? He can charge a million for a banana. The more of the currency that gets put into the economy, the more that merchants can charge for things. The less money that's in an economy, the less things can be charged for. Inflation is a rise in the money supply. It is not a rise in prices. The government wants you to think it's a rise in prices because then they get to blame merchants for it. Oh, those greedy merchants, they're always raising prices. The truth is the government is the one who's increasing the money supply and then it leads to higher prices. So inflation is simply a rise or an increase in the money supply. Is the United States currently inflating the money supply? Yes. What is hyperinflation? Hyperinflation is inflation gone mad. Inflation that actually outpaces the productivity of a nation. When the money supply increase outpaces the productivity of a nation, that leads to what we call hyperinflation. That's a very simplified uh, answer, but that's what hyperinflation is. Do we have examples of hyperinflation throughout history? Sure. But one quick note before we look at these. 
every single fiat currency throughout history has suffered death or collapse by hyperinflation. Ancient Greece suffered with hyperinflation, very first uh, documented case. Ancient Rome, tremendous amount of hyperinflation. China, flirted with paper money in the 9th century, 13th century, 15th century, have been burned by hyperinflation so many times. 1922, Austria had 134% inflation rate. 1932, Argentina had a total collapse of their currency. In 1944, Greece had an 8.5 billion percent inflation rate. 1946, Hungary had a 4.19, I'm not even going to say that word, uh, inflation rate. 1984, Israel suffered its own hyperinflation of 445 percent. 1990, Peru, 397 percent. 1993 to 94, Yugoslavia suffered the worst case of recorded hyperinflation, 5 times 10 to the 15th power. They actually had a radio program dedicated to maintaining the value of the currency uh, so you could dial in every 15 minutes. They would change the amount of money that money was worth. They ran out of paper in Yugoslavia because the store owners and the government were both using it. The store owners were using it to change their price tags, and the government was using it to print uh, money. 1994, the tequila hangover, uh, the peso crisis, total collapse in, Me in Mexico. 1997, Thailand bought, total collapse. 98, Russia, ruble, total collapse. Yeltsin, drunk, pushing the wheelbarrow full of rubles, and the worker says in the paper, we pretend to work, and they pretend to pay us. 2001, the Turkish lira, total collapse. 2007, Zimbabwe, 11 million then. It's actually approaching 1 billion uh, now, percent inflation rate. Over time, the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar has lost value. You can see just from this cute chart here from dollar days that uh, the currency has lost 94% of its value since 1933 and even more since uh, it was first come out. You see here the British pound. You can see this fiat currency has lost value over time. Purchasing, purchasing power of the Canadian dollar since 1913, tremendously lost value. Purchasing power of the Swiss franc uh, since 1913. And uh, the winner is, the best reforming currency of the 20th century was the Swiss franc. It only lost 80% of its value. Voltaire had this to say about paper money. He said it always returns to its intrinsic value, which is zero. Paper money has been warned throughout history. We've been warned by our founding fathers. Article 1, Section 8 gives Congress the express right to coin money never gives it the right to print money, and certainly never gives it the right to basically outsource that role to a private bank like we have with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve should be ended. Is this the, is this the right crowd to say that in? Yeah. Sometimes I say that I got a duck. Okay, let's focus on forecasting on the future. Mark Twain, I love what he once said, the art of prophecy is very difficult, especially with respect to the future. I'm going to have to stick to that, too, as I move forward and forecast. 